Okay, it is 1030 on this Thursday morning. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Parker and I am the Director of Alumni Career and Business Services here at the Michigan State University Alumni Association. We are excited to bring to you today our uh, first webinar series where we've actually invited an author who is also a Michigan State alumnus uh, to present on a book, uh, a book that they themselves have written. And, and Bill Holland is a very special person. I actually heard Bill through uh, an NPR interview and thought, wow, what an insightful person. I, I've spent the past three to four years working largely with displaced professionals in Michigan and oftentimes have heard people on the radio that I didn't agree or identify with in terms of the strategy they were sharing to help position people to be more competitive. And, and hearing Bill and then finding out that he was a Spartan, I knew uh, it was uh, important to connect with them. And Bill has been very enthusiastic about giving back to Spartan Nation. And those of you who are here today who, are, who may not be Spartan by degree, uh, but Spartan in heart, you're more than welcome. Um, Bill brings an extensive background. He's worked in several world-class organizations, including Chase Manhattan Bank, PepsiCo, uh, the Universities of California Riverside and in Pennsylvania, Charles Schwab, Anderson Consulting, Right Management. Um, he's been heavily involved in human resources and business outsourcing uh, initiatives, and he's uh, worked closely with parents and students to deliver effective career programs that, that help with career readiness. He's, our, he's authored one book prior to cracking the new job market, and that is, Are There Any Good Jobs Left? Career Management in the Age of the Disposable Worker. You may want to check that out. And he's got another one in the works, Career Ready at Graduation, What Parents and Students Can Do to Make It happen. That's near completion. So Bill, uh, we welcome you today. Just, just a few quick housekeeping uh, rules, or not really rules, just notes. We are not, um, we are using a still frame of Bill for your convenience. We've found some bandwidth does not ac accommodate well uh, a, a video stream, so that's why you see a, a still frame. There is an area, a chat area on the left side of your screen where you can pose questions to Bill. We will interrupt him from time to time to, to address some of those questions. And um, other than that, Bill, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Lisa, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. And, and welcome to, to all of you. And, and I particularly want to, to say uh, uh, to the Alumni Association and, and, and to Lisa that you know this outreach is, is a very, very important uh, to fellow Spartans in particular because of the turbulence of the job market. There are a lot of people out there looking, a lot of people trying to change careers, a lot of people trying to get their old salaries back. Um, and it really is time for alumni associations all over the United States uh, and elsewhere to really begin to, to step up. And I, I understand that some of you are, are not Spartans. Hey, that's OK. Um, and and, and that, that you are people or are a population or a group participating here at all different levels. Actually, that's very good uh, because I don't care if you're a, a CEO, uh, an administrative assistant, a middle manager, or whatever have you. The messages that I'm going to talk about in cracking the new job market are for all of you. And I think you'll see that as you go through. And that one of my main objectives here is to get you to, to understand, much of what you probably already understand, is what in the world is this new job market about. And, and I want to start by saying that while I appreciate the introductory comments uh, uh, about me, I, I want to share with you what I think is the essence of the, of the new job market. And that is that my credentials don't amount to a hill of beans unless I can give you something of value. If, if I can, at the end of this, have you see and understand and say, I can use that, then none of these credentials make any difference. Because one of the key tenets of the new job market is that it's not about me. 
And you will have gotten a long way down the road when you understand that when you present your credentials to the job market, it may hurt. It's not about you. It's about what the hiring organization wants from you. And that's a little bit of bad news. All of a sudden, you know, we go out there and we work on our graduate degrees and we do all the People, by and large, don't care. Companies, by and large, don't care. What they want to know is what you can do for them. And your degree is not sufficient evidence any longer of being able to do that. And so what the good news in that is that there is a new generation out here. The old generation, and this may sound a little bit funny, the old generation, Generation X, Generation Y and baby boomers are defined by the years in which they were born. The new generation, Generation Global, is defined by its mindset. And anybody can participate. Anybody can, can play. I don't care if you are a brand new uh, college graduate or if you're over 65. It doesn't make any difference. We have taken people who run the gamut in terms of their previous credentials, shown them how to use this methodology with great success. And so that's why I'm kind of excited to, to come to you. I really don't care what the job market's like. You, if you uh, uh, understand the new job, job market, are better positioned than ever to take advantage of what opportunities exist. Now, cracking the new job market has two parts to it. Part one is, is understanding what the market is. And I kind of apologize for this because I, I know you want to get more to the meat of it. But I do think it is critically important that you understand what the new job market is all about. And we're going to talk also about the tools that you need to compete. Because, and, and what's confusing, and, and you talk to some of the outplacement firms, because uh, I think the outplacement firms are still confused, uh, the tools sound as if they're very much the same tools we used before. Uh, and in some respects they are, but there are important differences, some of which will slap you in the face, others of which are simply nuances. But one of the things you're going to need to compete is a killer resume. And that's regardless of where you are. There are very few people in the world that don't need to show their resume. And you kind of know who they are because they're very famous. And, and, and when, they, when they go to do something else, uh, uh, people are glad to have them around, not because of goodwill, but because of the value they know they can create. And one of the things your resume will do for you is to demonstrate or to be a clear evidence that you are a person who can create value for somebody else. We're also going to talk about the use of social media. Uh, and, and how to go about doing that more effectively. If you have ever gone online and said, does anybody know where there's a job uh, uh, that I can, I can have or I can interview for? That is probably the weakest use of social media, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. And then, and then finally, uh, we're going to talk about pounding the pavement, and, and social media comes in there as well, because this is still a contact sport. Finding a job is, is a contact sport, but the way in which you connect is much different uh, than, than, than in the past. It used to be, it's so funny because a few years ago, the, all the outplacement firms were saying, well, you can't find a job on the internet. I got news for you, you can't find a job uh, without the internet. Or if you do, it's going to be very, very, very difficult. Your effective use of the internet makes looking for a job a lot simpler and a lot easier. Now, the second part, which is um, equally as important, because we're going to talk about preparing uh, for, for interviews. That's a 90-minute that's a session as well, hopefully with enough time uh, to, to, to answer questions. I, 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 I met a, a, um, uh, a freelance writer, uh, I guess now about uh, two or three years ago, and I started working with that person on... Uh, getting their resume together, and 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 the resume had an amazing effect. All of a sudden, this person was getting into places they had never gotten into before, and they would go in and they would say, "I'd say, how did it go?" And they said, "Well, it was great. You know, I, I got all these interviews." 
And I said, well, well how did it go? Well, I, I didn't do well in the interview. And I would say, well, talk to me about what we talked about and how do you prepare for the interview. And people get so enamored with the power that they find in their resume that they forget to prepare properly for the interview. And so we're going to spend a lot of time uh, on that and some other things uh, uh, talking about uh, how, what do you do after you get the interview. And then down at the bottom there, negotiating job offers, you may wonder, you know, this is such a tight market. I, I'm, I just want to, you know, give me a job offer and I'll tell you, I will accept it. Well, that probably is not the best way to go. Uh, and there are some very effective things you can do if, in fact, you know how to negotiate job markets, uh, job offers. So, and, and, then, and then, of course, uh, ongoing career management, we're going to spend some time on that. So with, with that as kind of some introductory comments, uh, let, let me get started on s defining what the new job market is. And everyone has talked about, that I know of, something called globalization. And I want to give that some granularity, if you will. The addition of Russia, China, and India to the job market, to the production and consumption of, of goods and services, added, are you ready for this, 1.5 four seven billion people to the job market and that includes a lot of highly educated low-cost workers if you look in the New York Times today you'll see an article in there on, on the front page about the number of professionals who are leaving China who, uh, who, who don't like the uncertainty that the Chinese economy has in it and are leaving China for the United States, for Australia, for other places around the world, I'm telling you it is a global world. And it's global not just in terms of people's ability to move, but in terms of the ability of companies to move the production of goods and services to other places. So globalization is real. And if you're going to compete in that market, you're going to find it frustrating and difficult if you try and compete on price because the low-cost jobs that require great education are being taken up by people who are a lot poorer than what you are. And so one of the things that we can learn to do to overcome that is to compete on value. And we'll talk more about how to do that. It will sound simple, and, and that's good that it will sound simple because what that means is there are a bunch of people out there who are going to get it. And, and, and it is easy to understand. The difficulty comes in the implementation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Let's talk just a little about technology. Here is, for me, a wake-up call. That the jobs today require fewer workers with greater skills especially in times of rapid technological burst. Think of this. The fastest growing companies in the Silicon Valley, uh, and when this statement was made, that th those companies, you know, Facebook and a few others, collectively had a market cap of about $6 billion. That's about the size of Walmart at the time with its 1 million employees. Those companies collectively, don't employ enough people to fill Madison Square Garden. That is frightening. The whole notion that we're going to have some kind of uh, 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 recovery in which we're going to keep manufacturing here in the United States, there's some extremely limited legitimacy to that point of view. But we are not going to reverse the globalization of the world nor the advance in technology. And if we try to do it, all we're going to do is get left behind. So it is a very, very, very uh, challenging world. And this is the world that we're going into trying to compete uh, for jobs. And so it's a very daunting task. I read a while ago in which Tom Friedman, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, New York Times journalist uh, and the author of The World is Flat, and he's got a couple other books, uh, in the works as, as I understand it, 
in response to all of this craziness out there in the market, said, and, and it's, it's something that I have found very compelling, that average is over. It used to be that you could go to college, get a job, and join the middle class. You could get a white-collar professional job if you wanted one. Those days are over. You used to be, when I went to school, you could be very average when you came out. And you could get a job making an, uh, an average living well, with an average lifestyle. And the average living and average lifestyle for most people meant you were going to be middle class. But today, average is over. And all of us needs to find our extra. What it is that we do well. Our unique contribution that makes us stand out in whatever field of employment we go into. It is it just, I, I'm not trying to plug the next book, but, but I do want to say one of the, one of the, the things I'm, I'm now writing about is that it is, it is critically important for, for students and their parents to take the undergraduate years seriously because not everybody graduating is going to find a job. And those that do will have a particular kind of profile that makes them attractive to employers. And so I want to tell people what that profile is and how to go about developing it. And, and it is, as Friedman said, average is over, and, and that is uh, extraordinarily threatening, but at the same time, it's a major opportunity, because what it means is, if you understand, if you get it, I don't care whether you graduated 30 years ago, as some people I'm working with didn't graduate at all, if you just graduate or, you, or you, you've been out for 10 or 15 years, once you get it, you can take that, wrap it up, and go to market with it uh, very uh, effectively. And, and so the new job market uh, has some advantages, uh, and, but and obviously some disadvantages as well, especially for people who use traditional job search methods. Now, I'm not going to sit here and, and read this slide. I, I, want to, I want to comment kind of um, on, on uh, uh, what happens in, in, the, in the new job market. Here is the way people used to go about looking for a job. And I encourage you to abandon what I'm getting ready to say. Not abandon the concept, but abandon the traditional way. Here's what would happen. And, and if, if, this, if this feels familiar to you, um, th then think about the alternative that I'm going to present. We would become unemployed. That was, that's kind of the first thing that, 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 that would happen. And, and then right after that, we would lose our self-confidence. I mean, it was, it's just it's incredible to me how we can even anticipate unemployment. We know it's coming. The whole job market is geared toward making sure you don't last a, a, a lifetime with a company. And yet, the minute we get unemployed, we lose our self-confidence. It's very important for you not to do that. I, I don't care what anyone says. In this world, unemployment is not your fault. I know that flies a little bit in the face of, well, how can I improve? Or maybe I could have done this right. All of that may be true, and I'm all for self-improvement. But by and large, the unemployment levels in this economy are not the fault of the individual. So I don't want you to go around carrying that burden. If, if you were in the market 20, 30 years ago, you could be the world's biggest jerk and keep a job. Because there just weren't that many college-educated, partially-educated people out there. But now there are tons of them. So the first thing that happen would be unemployment. Second thing you do immediately is to put your resume together. Okay, you know, what have I done? What, what, what can I, you know, what, what can I say about myself uh, and the like? Uh, that's somebody's phone. I'm not sure who it is. I'm going to try to turn it off. Uh, that is just a minute. Sorry about that. Oh, there it is. Sorry about that. But the second thing is you, you, you would put your, 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 your resume together. You would give it wide distribution, and it would go into a dark hole, especially now. You never, you never, never hear back, most of us, what someone thought of our resume, and there's some good reasons for that. 
and then you would tweak it uh, well, when a new job came up. That's the way we used to look for jobs. Let me give you another sequence and what the new job market is all about. Unemployment happens. That remains the same. The second and most important step you can take is to identify those jobs for which you are or can be a reasonable candidate. Notice you haven't started your resume, you haven't thought about a resume yet, you are looking for those jobs for which you may be a reasonable candidate. And then you find out what the employers who have those jobs are asking you to do. And then you put your resume together. That sequence of events, figuring out what other people need and want, and how you can respond in your resume, is how you demonstrate that you can create value that is relevant to their needs. That sequence, and once you understand that, you, you're unemployed, you're looking for a job, and the first thing you ask yourself is, what are the jobs to which I'm a reasonable candidate? Where are they? And what do those people need me to do? I, I just give you a, qu a quick example. I had a, uh, a, uh, a person a, a few years back apply uh, for, for an HR job. And I mentioned it in the book. And I, I encourage you to pick up the book and, and begin to use it as a, as a workbook for your job search or for your job change or, or whatever have you. Uh, because there are a lot of questions that are going to come up that that um, I, I won't have time to answer today. And you will find out in a, in a few minutes. We're also going to have an open mic session uh, a little bit later. Uh, I, next week sometime, uh, Lisa will talk to you more about that momentarily. And, and, and I'm going to make myself available. So if, if, if it's easier for you to send me an email and, and talk on the phone, uh, we can make arrangements uh, to do that. Uh, as, 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 as well. But I, I had this person put their resume together, had wonderful credentials, and couldn't get to first base. Worked for outstanding companies. And they came to me and they said, well, you know, what, what's going on? Not only do I not get an interview, you know, I'm not even hearing back from these people. And I said, show me the position description. And the most important element mentioned in the position description was they wanted someone who could reestablish the credibility of the function. And I said, is there anywhere in your, because the function had fallen apart, senior management was refusing to deal with the human resources department. They saw them as obstructionists and in the way. And they needed someone who could come in and immediately establish the credibility of the function. And I said, is there anything in your resume that would indicate that you could do that? And they had neglected that because there's a new job market out there. And the first thing they needed to do was not to present their credentials of all the things they've done. They needed to communicate what it was that the value that they could create for the employer. And the person said, you know, I've done that before. I said, well, then you got to tell that story. And how you tell that story is, is a little bit of what we're going to uh, be talking about as we move forward. So the golden rules of the new job market. Rule number one, your resume is not about you. And that's the first thing you understand about the new job market. It's about what people want from you. And you may ask yourself, are you saying to me, I have to do a new resume for every job I apply for? And the answer is absolutely not. But you got to get off on the right foot. And you get off on the right foot by understanding those jobs, and, those, and they will represent a family of jobs that make sense for you. Understand those jobs that make sense for you, and then figure out what they need and go from there. 
And once you do that a couple of times, you will find that jobs from similar companies and with similar situations have similar solutions. You may want to tweak it here and there to speak to particular aspects of the job, but you don't have to write a new resume for the whole thing. And so th th those are the golden rules, so to speak, of the new job market. All right, how do we go from that understanding to putting together a great resume? The first thing we do, or there are actually five steps. And those five steps are using the employer's keywords. And we'll talk about what, the, what, what that means momentarily. Then you'll sit down and list previous experiences. You'll then infuse those experiences with value. And then the least, the last and least, uh, uh, no, not actually, the fourth one is you'll select the best statement and then you'll format and refine your resume. And you'll find that formatting your resume is the least important of all of those. But in, in, you may ask, what, well, what's a key word? A key word is any word you think is key. And where do you find them? You find them in the position descriptions. So you find those jobs for which you're a reasonable candidate, read the position description. You might also want to visit their website. You also might want to read some industry publications so that in the final analysis, you have clarity about what's happening in that industry, what's happening in that company, uh, and, and what are the things they value that they've put on their website. Because that's the value you're going to have to learn to speak to. You know, it's really funny. Some people say, well, you know, in an interview, it's really important that you uh, know the situation of the company. Yeah, that, 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 that's kind of true. But you shouldn't go into an interview, and you will talk about this later, uh, being a smart aleck about, you know, well, gee, I read in the New York Times or in the Wall Street Journal. Blah, blah, blah. No. What you're trying to figure out is what they value. And you can do that by looking at the keywords. Let's talk about listing previous experiences. This is where most people begin their resume and end it. They sit down, they list all the things they've done in the past, and, and, and that's their resume. And that's an inadequate understanding of what a resume is all about. Infusing your experiences with values used to be tricky. With this methodology, it's no longer tricky. And we'll talk about that momentarily. In fact, it's very, very, very easy. Because you now know, for the first time, so to speak, what is of value. And so it's a matter of putting that value into your resume. And there are some tricks of the trade you can use to get that done. Uh, and then you obviously select the best statements and refine your resume. If I'm going too fast or too slow for any of you, please let me know or let Lisa know. And um, uh, no. we, we'll adjust that. I'm sorry, Lisa, go ahead. You know, I actually just have a, a question, and I'm not sure if, if you're going to get to it. But when we're talking about what employers need and what they value, um, it becomes tricky in times, for example, when job descriptions are short or they're a mixture, appear to be a mixture of several positions that they may be trying to solve at one time, or uh, various decision makers are in the mix with different priorities. Do you have any thoughts on how to nail down needs and, and wants in those situations? Uh, yes, generally speaking, especially for the first two, three, four jobs you apply for. And, and again, before you do your resume, do some homework. And I, it's homework with a purpose. And, 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 I, and what I'm mentioning now is the hierarchy of homework to be done. First of all, I don't care how brief the position description is, and you will find some brief position description. You'll find a lot of them that are, e that are also poorly written. I don't care whether they are brief or not, how well written they are. 
they reflect someone's thinking on what's important to them. At least give yourself a fighting chance and figure, in, and, and figure that out. So, the, 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 again, the first place to start is with that position description. So you, you worry a little bit about, and we will get to this momentarily. I'll show you some, some, um, a method for how to do this. Uh, then when, when, when you do that, you say, all right, well, now I know a little bit about the position description. Maybe I should visit the company's website. So you go to the website, and, and you, you, you say to yourself, what do they, do they value? And you'll see in the examples l later on. In this one position description, there are, there, there's one word that keeps popping up. Partner, partner, partner. Well, gee, maybe in your resume you ought to say something about your ability to partner. And I'll give you an example how important that is. In the Silicon Valley now, there are some companies that are doing performance appraisals of team leaders on a quarterly basis. Because, they, because of how fast things move and technology and, and, and the, the time to, to, to go to market uh, from idea to market is, is so short, they can't afford the luxury of finding out at year end that, that, a, that a team leader is ineffective or isn't working. So they are now make, making those decisions, and these are literally employment decisions, on a quarterly basis. And so if, 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 if that company, when they, when they, th those companies, when they do their position descriptions or they do their job descriptions, pardon me, one of the things they're going to put in there is teamwork or team building or team management. And that word will show up time and time again. That is your clue to needing to speak to that in your resume, in your cover letters, and in your interview. That's how you get past... You, you know, I don't want to keep going on this, but it, it used to be you put in your resume, they'd run it through, especially big companies, run it through a uh, uh, software that would pick out all the keywords and either qualify you or disqualify you. Well, they're not doing that anymore, not nearly, not nearly as much, because they now can tell almost in an instance whether or not you are worth pursuing. They got that in several other words. So the employer's key words, it's, it's important to, to show that you know what the employer values. Now, notice I didn't say you know what, 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 the, what, what the employer's values are. Those happen to also be important. But I'm talking about what they need to get the job done. So you can reflect that in your approach to the position by, and people find this hard to, to do. By literally using their own words to describe your qualifications. So if they need someone to reestablish the credibility of the function and you've done that, then one of the things you want to do is to say your one skill in particular is, is establishing the credibility or reestablishing the credibility of the human resources function. Now you, 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 you do it, you know, don't, don't, you don't, you don't disguise what you're saying, but as much as possible, use their own, uh, their own words, and, and you'll, you'll like the outcome. Okay, now here's an example, and you're just not going to be able to see uh, all of this, especially those of you who are sitting in uh, auditoriums. But when, when I say, go to the position description, again, this is the same one that's in the book, so, so, uh, so get that one. So, so get it out of the book. But, but it's the concept that I'm trying to, 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 uh, to walk you through. That you look at the position description and you, you begin to highlight it. And you go through what you consider the key words. Now, this is, this is, there is, this is art, not science. So in the, in the first uh, phrase up there, the first word uh, underlined is diversity, uh, continuous living, uh, employee commitment, and community involvement. And to the extent that you've done those things, make sure they find their way into the application process. What happens if you miss some key words? My reaction is don't worry about it. Because there are still hundreds of thousands of people who don't understand this. And the fact that you've gone through and given it your best shot is more important than you get every detail of it uh, correct. 
So you 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 highlight what you think are uh, the the key words. If you go down to the next paragraph uh, under strategy, one of the mistakes I made in 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 this is that I should have underlined the word strategy, and I didn't. And I I I cover it later. But the point is the ability to create. Uh, implement and measure strategy implementation happens to be an important part of this um, this position description, and so um, uh, I, I I looked at it and I kept seeing the same word coming up again, partnering with clients, uh, and and so gee I, I want to make sure this person somehow or other uh, gets that into their resume. Now we're going to move uh, to to another. Uh, uh, part of the highlighted position description and again it's less important that you read this and more important that you get the concept and and the concept is again if you go down to the second paragraph here uh, Lisa can they see my cursor or not so no, I'll let her answer that question yeah no I don't think they can they can't see my cursor. Okay. Well, uh, in the in the paragraph paragraph down below where where uh, the, the the highlighting takes place again, you have one the first paragraph just highlighting, and then you go down to the what it, where the highlighting starts in the other paragraph, and you see those magic words again, partnering with clients, and and after a while, you know if if you're looking at the position description that way, you come to the conclusion that these are people that are really in need of people who can partner with their clients. When you peel back the onion, here is what you find. You find the head of an organization usually who has a philosophical orientation about partnering, which becomes an important value uh, for the company as a whole. You find also probably some people who have failed in the company and the reason the job is open is, be, is because people don't successfully partner with clients. And if, and if you've got any of that experience, it is important that you get it into the uh, resume or into the application process. Notice I keep saying application process and not just resume. And the reason I'm saying that is, be, is because getting past the um, position description or getting past the position description to an interview is one thing. But for most jobs these days, hiring the right person is so important that you might go through several rounds of interviews, several rounds of follow-up activity, several rounds of, of, of having a chance to uh, ask questions. And, and, and so you want to make sure that that theme is consistent throughout all the stuff that you do. Because if it's not, these different groups that are come together that will come together to assess your candidacy will say, well, they were. One will say, well, he's very strong on partnering, and another person will say, well, I didn't hear that at all. You don't want that to happen. So that's why it's important to understand what is of value to the company and to make sure that it gets into um, the the uh, 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 the application process. So. I think I've said enough about um, um, the position description. Uh, again, it's very important for you to start with what is of value to the organization. And I hope you're beginning to see how people miss the boat, how they sit down, write their resume, dash it off, don't hear, and wonder why they don't hear. Because there are a lot of qualified people out there many of whom are highly educated, who are willing to work for a lot less money, and that puts you behind the eight ball unless you are able to compete on value. And one way to compete on value is to understand what is of value to the hiring organization and then provide them with it. And, and, and um, enough of that. Let's go to the website. I said visit the website. So you visit the website, and they and they and most websites um, now companies, you know, like IBM and General Motors, they have so many different websites. You 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 wonder which one you're supposed to pay attention to. 
uh, or so many pages on their website. But somewhere in there, they will describe either by division or by company as a whole who they are. And in this particular bank, and this is a real life position description of a job that was open, uh, they talk on their website about client focus. Again, they didn't use they used a different word, didn't they? They didn't use partner, but client focus, honesty and integrity. Almost all banks have to say that, incidentally. Uh, creating value, especially for our customers, respect and diversity. So you'll you'll try to figure out a way uh, to get that in as well. Now you do all this and you need to organize it, which is which is sometimes difficult. And again, this is in the book. So I put all this stuff in the categories. And, and across the top of this slide, uh, there is, okay, what are these people looking for in the way of strategy? What are they looking for from an advisory concept? Uh, who do I ad ad advise uh, in this job? Uh, what do I govern and what reports am I responsible for? Who do I support? And what are the knowledge and skills uh, that are required for this job? Now, your, your um, categorization of these words may be something altogether different. But, it, but put them in categories uh, if you can, simply because it makes the overall organization of your approach to the position description um, uh, uh, easier to organize. And so, you know, do that if you can. Uh, I, see a, um, I see a question down there, and it's a very good question from Gina. Uh, thanks a lot, Gina. Uh, and, and, and that is, how do you connect with an employer when there is no job posting? Let me say that if there's no job posting, be leery. It, it makes no, it's small, this is true of many small organizations. To the extent that you can, either by talking to people inside the organization, talking to the people who are interviewing, or going on the internet and finding out what is this organization experiencing. Or what is the industry experiencing? And to the extent that you can develop patterns of things that they are experiencing, there's a good thing that the organization you are looking at will also be experiencing those. And so, to the extent possible, you can't do what's not there. So if there's no position description, there's no position description. Uh, but, but adjust your resume or, or to construct your resume as much as you can in accordance to what this organization will likely value. Get as much of that information as you can and then adjust your resume to that. Uh, and Gina, if that doesn't uh, answer the question, uh, let me know. The, um, the, 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 that is really funny. I, I showed Lisa this slide. And, and, and Lisa said, you got to put this slide in there. And she had, had a lot of experiences with people who were experiencing some frustration around the job market. And, and let me tell you kind of what this slide says. That there is a, a more established hierarchy in terms of risk and reward. The higher the risk, the higher the reward. And the traditional jobs that you see on the bottom, the ones that many of you are applying for, are the ones that's, that are more difficult to get, especially at traditional prices or pr traditional salaries. And if you doubt that that's true, ask or talk to people who were, it, it, let, me, let me say it this way. It used to be in the 80s, late 70s, 80s, and 90s, that you get fired from a job, and the chances that you could go out and find a better paying job were absolutely terrific. That's almost over now. Because what's happening? A very substantial number of highly educated people are entering the job market who are willing to take less. And if that happens, those jobs aren't going to pay as much. That is tough. And the more risk you are willing to take, and I'll talk about the higher risk non-traditional jobs momentarily, the more risk you're willing to take, the higher the chances that you will make very good money, but also the higher the chances that you're going to get fired pretty quickly. Let me give you a job just like that. 
I am willing to bet that there aren't too many of you out there who haven't heard about temporary positions, temp jobs. And it used to be temp jobs were all clerical. And boy, has that changed. If you are a lawyer out there uh, and you are looking for work, there's a great chance that you will find a temp position as a lawyer faster than you're going to find anything else. And that's just the nature uh, of things. Uh, outpatient firms used to say to, to, to uh, uh, about temp jobs, you know, don't take them because it will, it will delay your ability to find a, um, a, a good job or, 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 or a more permanent job. That's no longer true. That's absolutely no longer true. And, 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 and not only that, those jobs, though they don't have benefits, they pay better because, and, and it's a lower, because it's a lower investment for the, for the firm. Uh, the firm, you know, the firm can, can can employ you at will. There are very few laws governing how those people are treated, and the one thing that keeps you in that position is performance. If you in that job can create value for people, uh, you're in pretty good shape. And even when you get terminated, the ability to create that value is the same thing that leads you uh, to your next employment opportunity. Very quickly, let me go to listing your experiences. And I'm just giving you a format here. I have no expectation that those of you who are in audience or in, in, in auditoriums or large rooms are going to read this. If you want the detail behind it, again, go to the book. And if you have a specific question about it, uh, and, and we don't get to it here, uh, we'll get to it during our open mic session that we're going to have next week, and Lisa will announce that shortly. And also, if, if you want to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we, we, can, we can get to it then. But, but this is that, that reverse chronological order. This is just capturing uh, what you've done in the past. And this is how most people write their resume. I work for a big service firm. I was from these dates. I had this position. Used to be the position you had was important. I was vice president of the world. People don't care. Organizations are flatter, titles harder to come by. IBM uh, abandoned those titles a long time ago. If you get to be a director at IBM, you are a big cheese. So, you know, and in a bank, if you are a vice president, it's a good chance you are a little cheese. So titles don't very mean very much. What they want to know is that third column out there is what have you done? And just tell them what you've done isn't enough, as you will see in, in a minute. But that's the order in which you go. Big service firm, the dates in which you did it, and the position description. Well, and, I, and let me just keep uh, pushing ahead here. Infusing your experiences with value. Here are, here, here is the golden rule. Quantify those experiences where possible. I don't care what culture you're in. Numerical indicators are universally accepted as expressions of value. I saved the company $18 billion, or, or what, 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 whatever it is. It, but if you can quantify those experiences, oh, incidentally, and going forward, capture what you're doing. So when the need to get a job comes around again, you got that information handy. I know quantification is not always possible. So when not, qualify it. Uh, we were top ranked, first place, one out of 355, wh 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 whatever it is. So infusing experiences with value involves quantification and qualification. And then when possible, use the same exact language a company uses in its position description to describe the value you created. And finally, and this is a big deal, and you get extenuating circumstances. Go back to the HR example. Uh, generally credited, that's another one of those qualifications, generally credited with developing and implementing a cost-effective talent acquisition strategy that resolved or reclaim the credibility of the function. 
And where did that credibility of the function come from? Came from the position description, almost the exact same language the company used to describe what it needed. And include insinuating circumstances, that you did this on time and under budget, in a politically sensitive environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So now you're beginning to see that the, that the, the way forward to a powerful resume, someone picks it up and they say, well, well hold it, Here, here's, a, here's a person, because I got in front of me 300 resumes, most of which are just kind of a snapshot of what people did at certain points in time, but I'm looking at a resume now that's speaking to me. It's talking a language that's using the language of words I understand. F credibility of the function, um, tight time, time frames, politically sensitive environment. That's all information, if you work it right, you can get from the position description, the website, and, and, and talking to people inside the company. Now we talk about selecting the best statements. Now keep in mind, I, I think people want to know, well, you know, I, I need a, my resume needs to be five pages because I can't possibly get all the great things I've done in two pages. Well, a couple of rules. One, it, it no longer has to be a two-page resume, incidentally. That's a, that's, a, that's a myth that the uh, <clears throat> outplacement firms invented, but they invented it for good reason because most people simply had no way of judging what should be in a resume and what shouldn't be in. These criteria, these are the criteria for inclusion. One, you ask yourself, does the statement that I have on this resume that I've captured, right? I mean on this, this, this list of accomplishments, does this statement illustrate value I've created? Not, not does it create, does it illustrate value I've created that's consistent with, with, with the firm, but does it illustrate value I've created? And then is that value useful to my prospective employer. Someone sits down and they say, well, I have a PhD in, in English or math or whatever have you. And I've had people who have actually done this. I said, well, don't put that on your resume. Well, why not? Well, because you're in pharmaceutical sales. I mean, someone may find that nice, but they're, they're going to either say you're overqualified or they're going to wonder, like, what does this got to do with anything? They don't want to hear from PhDs in English, even though it's a wonderful accomplishment and it has important value to you. It may not belong in the resume. Yeah. And there's suggestible statement included. If not, yes. I'm sorry, I just wanted to interject a quick question on that one. Some of the individuals that I work with, when it comes to excluding things like a PhD from their resume, worry that that might look uh, dishonest, that they're lying. Can you comment on that, please? Oh, I, I, uh, thank you, Lisa. I'd love to comment on the lying thing because I, I just, uh, in, in the other book I'm, I'm finishing up now, I talk about establishing a profile, and the same is true of establishing of, of writing a resume. The, the question is, what is a resume? A resume and a profile, if you're a student in college, is a marketing document. It is not a document that is intended to reveal all your secrets or expose all your attributes that you think are important or all the information that you want necessarily to tell someone. It is a statement about the relevance of your experiences to the job at hand. And that's all. It is, it is not true or untrue in that sense. That is, excluding things somehow are, 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 are deceitful. Let's, let's take the hard case. Let, let's absolutely take the hard case. Let's say you are a, 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 an ex-felon. Do you put that in a resume? And the answer is that depends. If, if it is relevant to the job in question, it might be something that you want to include. But I would be very smart about how I include it. I would, I would and, this, and this has to do with, with negotiation. We'll talk about that later. I would wait 
until the appropriate time and say, listen, there's something about my background that I want, I want to make sure you know and you understand. Can you imagine how powerful that is? And, and, and let's, let's assume the worst. Let's assume they find out before you've had a chance to get to the, 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 the inner line and you get eliminated. Well, I got news. If they were going to eliminate you for that, then you, you, you're not going to get the job anyway. So, so it, it doesn't mean it, it's, not, it's not true or false. It's a matter of timing. Now, there are a lot of you who could argue with me about that, and I think it's worth arguing about. I, I Don't get me wrong. But, but I'm, you asked me for my take on it, and I'm giving you my take. I'll give you another example. Uh, should you dye your hair if you are, are gray or prematurely gray or you think it makes you look old? The answer is I don't care. Now, is, it, is, is that deceitful? I, well, I, I don't, I, look, my appearance is an advertisement. That's what it is. It's a marketing document. I don't think we ask McDonald's to tell you how unhealthy their food is. We make them do things like list the calories, we, and, and, which is kind of why I disagree with what's going on in New York, telling people what size uh, soda drink they can buy. I mean, I think that's, that just goes way too far. But, but, but McDonald advertisements are marketing documents. That's what they are. My, my, my niece is a, uh, is a vice president of marketing for a beer company, and I happen to know that... that, that, that too much consumption of beer is, is a problem with alcoholism. Now, d does that mean that the beer companies, you know, at least they now say drink responsibly. But notice they're not saying don't drink. I mean, you need to put some reality into this thing. And I, and I encourage people not to lie, but not to shoot themselves in the foot. It, it, um, so so I, that's kind of where, 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 where I am, am on that. Let me... Let me Push ahead. I think we're doing pretty well on time. I'm, I'm pleased with where we are. Here, of all things, is the least important of everything you can do, and it's called formatting your resume. Why, why, do, why, why do I say that? I say that because content is always more important than format. Always. I don't know. I mean, there are, there are some formats, and I want to give you a couple. There are some formats that tip your hand in a positive direction. For example, if you got a Harvard MBA or uh, one of my, uh, one of my uh, uh, former colleagues and clients is now just finishing his MBA at Stanford. Tremendous guy, very bright. If you go to my website, www.crackingthenewjobmarket.com, and you listen to the video in which I introduce myself as, as the right job guy, uh, that's Dan Gross, uh, who, who gives me kind of a, 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 a testimonial uh, on, 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 the, on that website. Um, he was the one who really uh, brought this uh, to, 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 to my attention. It makes no difference what the format is. There is something that does make a difference. Your resume has to be free of mistakes, because a mistake will sink you. But what format you use, listen, companies are desperate. And if they see someone <clears throat> that, that has the background that they need, they'll go for it. So <clears throat> I have a, a, a format that I recommend. I'm hardly suggesting that you should uh, stick with it. Um, I, I want to uh, begin to skip some of this because I want to spend a little time on, on questions. Um, I recommend that you come up with a summary statement. I include one uh, in the book. It tells uh, where you fit in the hierarchy. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you want to be known as. Um, and it gives you a chance to use uh, some personality, so to speak. So I came up with a senior management professional with a proven track record of developing future-oriented strategies. You remember that position description? Future-oriented strategies? Uh, there's no doubt about where that came from. That maximized shareholder value, remember that? 
Background includes financial management, strategic planning, marketing, and business development. A creative thinker, this is use a little imagination, a creative thinker who can bring an innovative approach to difficult business issues, an energetic and enthusiastic leader with a reputation for developing strong relationships, partnerships, and interfacing at all levels. Be careful. If you are uh, a, a student who, if you are in France, this will work. If you are in England and they know you are an American, this won't work. If you are in China or Japan, this probably won't work. And the reason is all of these things need to be filtered through your own culture, your own cultural norms. And talking about yourself uh, as though you are the cat's meow is a, it's not uniquely American, but it is particularly American. And the French like to do this. Um, the English do it a little bit differently. Uh, but the Chinese and the Japanese might even find this offensive. And so when I give you a summary statement of who you are, it is to be used with advisement. And the best way to do it is to go to some of your friends and say, hey, take a look at this and tell me uh, what you think. So it's, 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 it's that kind of thing. So you then um, put in your accomplishment statements, which are the, the, the heart and soul of, of, of the whole thing. And, and also, and, and this one always surprises me, um, and I, this, is, this is really kind of fundamental and elementary, but I put it in because just, it's not the kind of thing that a lot of people have ever had a chance to think about. And that is using the result action format. The, you, the, way you, the, the statements in a resume are not complete sentences. And, and you start with what the results were and then what was done to accomplish them. And then the actions taken to get it done. So that, that's the way that, and again, that's spelled out in, in more detail uh, in, in, in the resume. And, and, and here's an example of what was accomplished. Reduced order entry errors from 5 to 20% and sped the process 400%. That's what we did. And we did that by initiating, creating, and managing the implementation of the company's first fully automated, real-time, user-friendly, too many words, I wouldn't write this statement this way again today, and paperless order entry system for a high-volume department, on time and under budget. Now, that's a little bit too much, but I, I put it, I left it in there because it's easy to change to give you uh, an idea of, of what that's all about. Okay. Now, additional suggestions uh, for entry-level positions in particular. You, 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 not entry-level. If you just graduated from college, or you, let's say you're out one or two years, your most significant accomplishment, by and large, up till then, is your education. So the format for an entry-level resume is a little different from the format for a more experienced resume or the format for... Uh, someone uh, who is at a senior level. Um, so, so, you know, consult the book for more information on that. Um, and, and the credentials at the end of a resume, it can, you know, include honors and awards or activities or licenses or, or stuff like that. And, and I say keep the resume to one or two pages if possible. Uh, but if you can't, I, I tell you what, keep it there if possible. If, if at all possible, and let's let it go with that. Uh, but it's no longer a hard and fast rule. Uh, and, uh, and also, resumes need to be error-free. All right, now, you, you say, why in the world would you put something up that you can't read? Well, that's a good question. And, and one of these days, I'm going to figure out a way to get the whole resume, all two pages up, uh, so you can read it. Uh, but, but again, that, that's in the book. This is a sample resume. Um, reference it in... Um, and use it uh, to the extent that you like the format and it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, use another format. Okay, let me get to social media because that, that is, is, is important. The, the, there is great news out there. Most of you, if you are younger in the audience, you've heard this a million times, already know how to use social media. Um, others of you who are in your 60s, um, good news is the fastest growing uh, Facebook signees are people who are who are over who are over 55. So that population is catching up. 
Um, but don't expect social media to um, get, land you a job. Be leery of exaggerated claims. I, I listened to a, a, um, a, a guy who was selling uh, their approach to finding a job, and he said, I've had <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, the, some incredible number of people use this, and 90% and, and of them found jobs in two weeks. I hate to tell you, folks, that's a lie. That's just a lie. I, mean, I don't know how any other way to, to, to put it. There is nothing I know of, nothing I've heard of, nothing I've seen, nothing I've experienced that would suggest that this is an easy slug. It's not. But it'll get a lot easier if you use social media to advertise your job search. And by that I mean start talking, uh, start, you know, uh, first of all, join LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the only, not the only, but it's, it's, it's a website dedicated to professionals. Get to know people on LinkedIn um, because it's an excellent way to find, find uh, contacts. I, I, I had a client the other day ask me about some job in sales. I can't remember what it was. It was an area in which I had absolutely no experience and never in my life thought I knew anyone in that area. I then went to my LinkedIn account and, and, and basically asked to see um, the ways in which I was connected to this particular uh, uh, industry. And I found 30 contacts of mine who were connected to people in that industry. That's absolutely amazing. I am now in a position to, to ask them a question, certainly not for a job, to, to go to them and say, I'm looking for information on. Uh, can I talk to you about that? Or can someone give me an introduction to? That's, that's how you use... Uh, social media. Anytime Sears has a Facebook account, you know Facebook works. Because that's exactly what happens. Every major company now in the world, practically every radio station has a Facebook account. And they get, and, they, and listen, if you go to my, my um, a website, I would appreciate it if you would like me on, on, uh, on Facebook. Because that spreads like wildfire. I had, I was, I'm just absolutely flabbergasted. The, the, uh, Lisa uh, went on my website and she said, "I love your 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 video. It's really it's really terrific." And she clicked, uh, uh, "I like you." And the number of people that contacted me and said, "I see Lisa thinks that's pretty good." Well, I happen to know Lisa, and I think that what she thinks, if she thinks it's good, I'm on board, kind of thing. So if you if you like what I have to say, go. And that would that would be a big help, and I and I thank you for it. Uh, but you can get connections to companies, and you can learn what's going on in, 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 the, in the latest buzz. And incidentally, companies do hire off job boards. I think you have to be careful, but they absolutely do hire off job boards. And, and, um, I was I was on the I was on um, I think it was NPR uh, with the, um, the 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 car company that said we pick you up. Whoever that was, the, the woman who does who was the hiring uh, director for that company, and 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 the and the and the guy said you know. Do you hire off job boards? She said, "Of course, absolutely. We do it all the time." And so, and so, you know, you say, "Can you find a job on the internet?" My reaction is, "I don't. It's hard to find a job without the internet." And finally, finally, in the sense of of of, of doing your job search, it's a contact sport. You never know where leads are going to come from or what's going to boomerang back your way. I, 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 very early in, in my, when my kids were, were young, we, we had these stray dogs uh, uh, get lost. And, and um, we returned those dogs. And the guy tried to give me a, a reward. And I said, come on, I'm not going to take a reward for doing something I, I, I would have done anyway. I can't tell you how many times that act of kindness boomerang back. I've been paid in, in currency that I can't describe for that experience. So looking for a job as a contact sport and reach out to as many people as you can. And even your enemies. The people I didn't get along with in high school, I didn't even particularly like in high school or college or wherever have you. Some of the nicest people I, uh, in, in the, uh, well, I could go on and on and on and on, but, but, but don't be too proud to tell people you're looking. 
Poll your friends and your enemies. Contact professional associations because in the final analysis of the scarce job at market, it only takes one contact to deliver. So that's much of, of, of what I have to say. There are a million things I, uh, I left out. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to do now is to spend a little more time uh, going into some of the questions and, and perhaps going over a couple of points. But I, I do want to, I'm not closing because we're going to come back at this and, and with some real good information around negotiating job offers and, and the like next time around and when we, we, we have that, that open mic. But what I'm trying to get across to you is that this job market has fundamentally changed. And when, when you know how and what to do about it, it empowers you. And, and I've, what I've tried to do is to give you some sense of how to go about that. Practice it, you'll get good at it, and, and, and it'll work. So with that, let me stop and answer any questions. Lisa, you have any comments you want to make? Well, I'm seeing a lot of great questions in the feed. Um, one from Matt is more of a point. Um, if the employer has a problem, they need to hire someone, isn't it our job to demonstrate to them how we can help solve the problem? Let, let me respond to that, Matt. Uh, the, the, first of all, thank you for the point. Because the point is, the most important skill you can demonstrate is the ability to solve problems. Because that involves almost all of the other skills. Working through people, partnering, Team work. You can work through people but not solve problems. You can partner but not solve problems. You can have good technical skills but not solve problems. Companies pay people to do stuff because they're trying to solve a problem. And in the final analysis, your ability to do that, I call problem solving the ultimate skill. So you're, you're, you're right, Matt, and thank you for pointing that out. Beth is wondering if you could speak to the use of automated application systems and how to best represent yourself and stand out in a process like that to earn an interview? The answer is absolutely the same. Now, there are some people, if you, if you, there are some other books out there that, that, that encourage the use of gimmicks. You can put your picture on your, uh, on your resume. You can, put, you can, you can embed uh, video links. Uh, 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 on your website or uh, on your, your, re your resume. I, I don't encourage any of that. I think it, it misses the mark as much as it hits. I would say that when you learn to use the methodology I'm talking about here, that is the methodology of value creation, finding out what it is that companies want and need and, and how you can speak to that, you will be ahead of the game. There will always be technological innovations that, in, that, that suggest to you you should take the next step. I am not in a position to advise you on that. But I do know enough to know right now, I think it's a fairly risky proposition. And if there's one skill to master, it is the skill of speaking to the value that the company is interested in by filling the job for which you are an applicant. Master that skill, and if there are add-ons, you know, fine. But as a basis, basic, do, the, do what I'm suggesting. Bill, Catherine would like to know, how do you decide how far back to go on your resume? 10 years, 20? What's the strategy on that? Catherine, uh, uh, thank you. Th this is why we encourage people to keep it to two pages, because there is no easy rule to follow in going back. If you are preparing a chronological resume, which I encourage most, most people to do, there are some exceptions to that, uh, where a functional resume is more, more appropriate. But if you're preparing a chronological resume, I would say go back uh, a, a, for as much, go back as far as the room on the resume will allow you, and then experiences before that capture in a summary form, and don't detail them. 
does, does that does that I don't know if that makes sense or not. So so if thirty years ago um, you had a job and you 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 did certain things, you had four jobs, you did certain things. You would characterize that as also experienced in the following kinds of stuff, and just leave it at that. Do it in a summary statement. So the the the, the cheap way to, to, to go back is to limit yourself by the number of pages you're going to the, the amount of room you have in the resume. Yep. Which which means you got to do a good job of figuring out what statements you want in and what statements you you want you want to leave out. That's why that that early exercise is important. Any other uh, questions, Lisa? I'm seeing several. Um, a question from Tim. Any advice for those of us who are looking but still have a job and don't want to let the current employer know we are looking? Yes, that is a good strategy. That is not to let other people know you are looking. Uh, that, that is, I, I, you know, companies always surprise me at how intolerant they are about employee, employees who are looking for advancement. Um, and, and so one of the things you have to do is to be a little more selective about who you, uh, how you distribute your resume. And when you do that, you, and, 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 and it's a plus if you're already employed, you need to tell wherever you're applying, discretion is appreciated. I would not use company phones. I wouldn't use company email. I would, you know, because all of that stuff, and it's a matter of law, I'm not a lawyer, but I know enough to know that, that it's not something, uh, it's something that companies don't have to subpoena, they can just simply go get and watch what you're doing. So I would use my own private <clears throat> instruments, phone, email, and the like, uh, to look. I'd be careful about where I distributed my resume and how I distributed it, and I would, I would, I would ask, and, and most companies get this, to, that, that uh, 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 dis discretion is appreciated. And most people understand that and get it. Bill, Ann and Catherine are wondering, they, they don't particularly have any personal interest in Facebook. Do they still need to create an account to demonstrate they understand the, the software, the application? Uh, you know, I can't believe the quality of the questions. Not because I didn't expect it. It's just, it's just, it's just very exciting and pleasing to me. So I, I think all of you who are asking questions. They, they, they are all great. Here's my take on Facebook. Uh, first of all, Facebook is a very powerful tool. I, I, you, you don't have to use it to find a job. I would encourage you to figure out what it's all about. And one of the ways you can do that is to go on Facebook and to uh, participate in discussions and join groups that, that are, represent interest areas of yours. And just figure out what it's about. And then after you do that, you can leave it alone, but, but uh, understand it. It's one, thing, it's one thing not to use a technology or tool uh, because you don't have a use for it, but it's another thing not to understand what the uses are. And what I'm encouraging you to do is to understand what the uses are. Uh, Bill, great answer. Um, the next question from Eric, I'm, I'm thinking might actually be covered in part two. Many times the interview process involves a series of individuals with uh, interviews with multiple stakeholders with different needs. Any tips on managing the group interview? Uh, the, the, when, when he says group interview, let me make sure I understand. When you, oh, you mean when one person is interviewing a, a lot of other people? When one, per one person is, is going to interview in a company and there are, they have to go through more than one person to interview, right? I don't know. Did I get that right? Eric might need a clarify. Well, I, I, I'll assume that that's, that, 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 that's the answer. There are a couple of tricks you can use. That, when I say tricks, I don't, I don't mean deceiving people. Try to find out who the interviewers are, that is, who the stakeholders are. And what is their, is, you know, you, you, you're you talking to the HR department. You can say, you know, who, uh, or, or, or even the hiring manager. Hey, can you, can you help me understand who I'll be talking to and, and what, what their titles are? And is there anything in particular that they would be interested in? Most interviewers, most, 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 most companies will give you that information. And that is an enormous amount of information. 
because all of a sudden you know if you if you're interviewing someone from finance that you know they're going to want to know something about finance if you're interviewing someone from the project management team they're going to want to know something about project management and 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 so you know prepare yourself knowing who they are and what their interest is Next question from Don. Also, something I think we'll probably cover more next week. If we have a long period of unemployment, how do we handle this on a resume? Yeah, I will talk to you about that next week in in, in more detail. Uh, be aware that today, especially, most people don't care. They they really don't. I mean, every, you know, everybody gets it. You know, you know, show me someone who hasn't been out of work in this economy. Uh, so some level of gap is okay. I also think it's okay to camouflage the gap. And I'll show you more how to do that uh, in, the, in the next session. Got anything else, next Lisa? Next question, actually. Oh yeah, there's several. A job seeker declined a job offer uh, through a headhunter. When should she follow up to see what other opportunities might be available? Say, a, a, a job seeker declined a job offer. Declined an opportunity through a headhunter. When should she okay. follow up with that headhunter to see what other opportunities might be available? Right away, in declining it, you simply say, and 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 and, and th th that's an important question. The the um, look, if 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 a headhunter contacts you and you're not interested, you say, hey, look, I am not really interested uh, in in this particular job, but that doesn't mean I'm not interested in others. So if you see if something or something that comes down the pike, terrific, let me know. Now, notice what I didn't say. I didn't go into a whole bunch of reasons why I'm turning this job down. I just said I'm not interested. Because you don't want to give people information that they can misuse. You know, oh, gee, I got another job here, and, and uh, this is the same job he turned down before. So, gee, maybe I'm not going to ah, forget it. I'm not going to go that way. Just says, I'm not interested. But, pardon me, but there's a good chance I'll be interested down the line. So, hey, uh, right away, let, let them know. And then try to establish ongoing contact. Um, if you know of someone that you think might be interested, say, hey, look, you know, I, I'm not interested, but I know uh, so-and-so over here might be. Let me touch base with them to find out if it's okay for me to submit their name. And by the way, when you, are, you have other jobs open, I know an awful lot of people, so I could be a good reference for other uh, for for getting you people then what are you doing you are giving that person something of value to them and they will call on you again and again and again I got headhunters that still call me today because I've referred people and have helped them out right uh, another question from Cynthia I'm currently applying for teaching positions with a master's degree in curriculum and teaching the colleges I'm applying to all want me to have a PhD are higher degrees necessary and how effective are online PhDs are they by oh. Oh, oh wow what a great question I love you guys geez this is absolutely terrific because so much of this I've, I've, I'm putting in my other book um, here is the tricky part of online degrees. Generally speaking, there are no admission requirements, and their degrees do not have the same level of cachet in the marketplace as other degrees. They, their students drop out more and default on loans more than anybody else. So you don't go into the job market with the wind at your back. Doesn't mean it's in your face. But when they have a chance to hire someone from Harvard, someone from Michigan, someone from Michigan State, they will probably look at them more favorably over you. And that's the reality, whether the for-profit people want to admit that or not. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't get a degree. But here's my experience with um, PhDs. I had a, 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 a 
a, a woman that helped me develop the curriculum, in fact, this curriculum that we're using right now, a number of years ago, uh, or the beginning of it. And I asked her, I, sa I said, Lee, you, you don't have a master's degree in curriculum development. And yet you're so busy working for companies developing curriculum, curricula, uh, uh, content. How, how is that? What do you do when someone says, we want a PhD and you, or, 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 or a master's degree? And you don't have one. She said, I ignore them. I submit my credentials and let them speak for themselves. And there are times when that will crack the job market. So if you don't have a degree, go ahead. I'm just telling you, we got uh, five more minutes and one more question. So I just wanted to insert that. Did, did I cut you off in the middle of your answer for Cynthia? No, I'm, I'm done. I mean, we can talk about that in more detail later if she likes. So the, the two remaining questions actually come from uh, Greg and, oh boy, I'm sorry I missed above, but Greg just simply wants to know about um, speaking with a recruiter who discards resumes that don't have dates, for example, next to degrees earned. And then the next question will roll into our final slide of how do they get in touch with you if they're not an MSU alum? Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, um, you can get in touch with me. There, there, there are two ways you can get in touch with me. You, you can get in touch with me through my website, and I think there's a contact me thing in there. In, and um, uh, you can send me an email at billholland123 at gmail.com. Um, if, if you want to continue any of this discussion and you, you can't make the open mic session, I'll be more than willing to talk on the phone with you individually if I can do that. It, it may be hard, but what will happen is you'll send me an email. You will give me your, well, I'll have your email address, but I'll give you a time. You give me times when you can call me, and then if that works for me, I'll send you an email back with my phone number, and, and you, can, um, uh, you can call me at that, at, at that number. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, and I think it's a good time to mention we're, we're at three mu minutes to noon. Bill has graciously offered to extend more of his time to the participants of this webinar between the conclusion of, of our event and the beginning of next Thursday's part two. So if you're interested, you are welcome to follow the same link that you used today at noon on Monday from noon to one. There won't be any uh, PowerPoint slides. It's going to be Bill answering your questions from part one content through questions you pose in chat, just like today. So um, I really appreciate, Bill, the time that you've given today. Appreciate the involvement of the audience that was here. As you stated, great questions. We hope to see um, a good turnout Monday at noon, a great turnout on Thursday for part two because having been privy to the entire uh, content, I think it ties together nicely, and you'll be glad that you, you took it in. We, we asked a lot of you in two 90-minute sessions, but, but it really does tie together well. Bill, any parting thoughts? Yeah, let me just say that, that and I, I mentioned it earlier, and it, it has to do with two things. One, this job market, has not only changed, but it's changed forevermore. It's more technical and, and global. Secondly, whatever you do, don't lose your self-confidence. I remember talking to a CEO who had been successful all of his life. And he came to me and he said, you know, he says, I'm shocked. I've laid off a lot of people before. I had no idea how debilitating losing your job is. And I said to him, it's the nature of the market. It's changed. And people are hired and fired with impunity. So don't blame yourself. Pick your chin up. Learn what the new job market is all about. You can get there again and again and again if necessary.
Excellent way to end that. Um, thank you everyone for attending. You should be getting an email with requests for feedback. We would love to have that. If you need to get in touch with us in between today and next Thursday, Bill's given his email address as you see on the screen. I can be reached at the MSU Alumni Association, easy to Google and find, Lisa Wiley Parker, also Lisa P, as in Parker, at msu.edu. So go green. Lisa, let me add one thing before you get off. Lisa? Yes? Uh, are, are we still live? We're still live, and I'll, I'll uh, catch up with you I in a moment. I want to say one more, one, more, one, one more thing. If any of you know of other alumni associations out there that you think are interested in doing the same thing for their alumni, for, for, for their alumni, let me know or, or tell them about what you've been through, and, um, and I'll be more than happy to work with them. They will have to do it on a retainer basis, but it's still very reasonable. Thank you. Excellent point. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, everyone.